Thank you very much for finding time in your busy schedules uh, to come uh, to this uh, to this event. Uh, today, I will be talking about employment and mental health and how findings from some projects that I have been involved could contribute towards uh, policy making uh, about shorter standard work uh, working week. Uh, you can see here a Twitter uh, handle for employment dosage project where most uh, findings I will be talking about are coming from. And you also can see names of other uh, researchers that in one or another way have been involved in the project that I will be uh, discuss uh, discussing. Uh, here's an overview of my presentation. I will start with um, uh, uh, discussing uh, paid work, why paid work is important for workers' mental health. Then I will touch on future trends in workplace, how it could affect mental health, and how a shorter working, a shorter standard working week could be a policy solution for uh, for some challenges the future of. Uh, employment might bring. Uh, then I will present evidence from three studies, one on shorter working week as that answers to the question how short this shorter standard working week might need to be from mental health perspective. Then second question, what matters quantity or quality of job? And finally, I will, uh, I will look on how a more recent policy, uh, policy solutions such just for low and part-time work during the pandemic affected mental health of employees. And I will, um, I will finish with discussing policy implications of these findings. So why, why mental health matters for, uh, for uh, why employment matters for mental health? There's a large body of literature that shows that in our paid work focused society, Paid, uh, paid work is very important for adult mental health. Uh, we know that uh, coming unemployed often means decline in somebody's mental health, increase in depression, anxiety, and, and other mental health issues. And in the reverse, uh, getting a new job uh, often improves men uh, mental health. Uh, why is that? Uh, because employment is a social institution uh, which brings some psychological uh, benefits, in addition to uh, obvious financial benefits of having an income. And these psychological benefits are time structure. Uh, when somebody becomes unemployed, the first thing that goes out the window is the need to get out of bed at a certain time, get dressed and leave, uh, leave the house. Uh, also, uh, jobs give us opportunities to meet people outside of uh, our own family. It gives us purpose, it gives us status. One of the first things that we ask uh, to somebody new in it. As a result of job loss, mental health gets um, impacted uh, and it might lead to depression and, and anxiety. Uh, this knowledge is uh, very important if you think about trends in future of work. You probably have um, heard debates about robots and machine learning taking over our jobs. Uh, so there are different estimates how many jobs might be lost in the next 30 or 50 years. They range from none to 50 percent. Um, one might say we've been there before or we have had these discussions in 80s and 70s. However, this, uh, in this time, these predictions might become true because a change in technology is affecting many sectors, many industries, and in a fast, uh, faster speed as on in previous decades. And also, we have a COVID-19 crisis that has changed uh, labor market significantly. As a result of this future of work trends, we might predict there might be rise raise in unemployment levels when I mean, a large proportion of people won't be able to find jobs. What could be policy responses in this case? Well, first, first of all, we already have seen one of policy responses for low, either full or flexible. We could also invent some new jobs, uh, but previous experiences show that new jobs are a much higher, uh, require much higher skill levels and the jobs that have been lost, so the skill gap is quite large. 
uh, then maybe we just should accept mass unemployment, maybe with some help of uh, universal basic income. And one of policy responses that I will focus on today is radical reduction of working hours. Uh, there have been debates that maybe instead of standard five days working week, we need we need a four days uh, four days working week. And this might be a good policy response because we could reduce the standard working week and then share remaining or surplus hours that have been created by reducing standard working week. Um, to, uh, we could share them to the unemployed people who can't find a job. However, there are some questions that are very important when we talk about shorter standard working week, but but the questions that surprisingly have not been answered so far by research. The first question that comes in mind is, what is the minimum amount of paid employment needed to deliver some or all well-being mental and uh, mental health benefits that employment has been shown to bring? Uh, do we need to work eight hours a week to, to feel better? Or do we need to work at least four days a week? And maybe five days is not, in, uh, not, uh, not enough. The second question is also, what is the optimum number of working hours at which the mental health of workers is at its highest? If we know this optimum, then maybe a shorter standard working week should be at this optimum of working hours, not at any, any other number. Uh, for example, currently discussed idea of four days working week is not empirically uh, grounded in any kind of evidence. It might not be the optimum and it might not be even the minimum. Then also we have to ask the question, what is more important, quantity or quality of work? What if we reduce the working hours, uh, but it comes with the usual caveats that part-time work comes with limited opportunities for promotion, um, insecurity, etc. And the and the fourth question that I will be answering today is um, what effects did for low reduced working hours have on mental health during the pandemic? Uh, because uh, this knowledge could give us some indication how reduced uh, working hours. Uh, could uh, could affect in, uh, us in the future if we have a shorter standard uh, work a working week. Now to answer these questions, we use several data sets. Um, one, uh, the first two questions were answered using understanding a society survey. Uh, nine waves of it. Um, this is a unique and amazing source for researchers. Uh, who are interested in policy relevant questions like I outlined uh, uh, above. So we use nine years uh, and uh, approximately 85,000, um, um, uh, uh, nine years of data from 85,000 people. We looked at weekly working hours one is expected to work and um, on the questions that asked about uh, people's mental health. There are three very well established uh, measurements that reliably measure mental health. Uh, we, of course, uh, took into, uh, uh, into account um, other important characteristics such as demographic, household, job characteristics, including, including income. And before I proceed, uh, and show the results, I would like to ask the audience um, use question and answer function and then think about in your, your personal situation, taking into account where you are in your career, what's your life situation, if you would have a choice to reduce your working week, what do you think, what would be the minimum and optimum number of working hours you would have to work, have a better mental health than you have now, uh, than you have now. What do you think? What would be your, uh, what what should your working hours be? I'm asking this because before we carried out data analysis, we asked our older friends and relatives what they uh, thought what the shorter standard working should be in terms of mental health, and it was amazing to see that people seem to have sort of agreement. So I would like to see whether we have the same agreement here as well. And then I will check questions and answers. Um, what numbers are coming up? 
uh, your uh, your salary no your salary would be proportionate to uh, to what you are uh, what you are earning uh, now so the 24 hours and just if you would have a choice of course income is important consideration four days 20 24 some some are happy to go six uh, six hours a uh, uh, day or twenty fours. Um, so this number seemed to be between twenty four and thirty um, hours a week, and that was the same what we got when we asked our friends and uh, relatives. Let's see what does the uh, evid uh, does the evidence say. Uh, so the result. I will just show one of the graphs. We have many of them, but this is a graph that illustrates um, our findings. So what you can see in this graph. On a vertical axis on the left side, you have mental health. Um, higher number is a better mental health. And then in a, a horizontal axis, you have number of working hours that people are expected to work. And panel left is for those who moved from unemployment to employment. And panel B is uh, those who moved from being economically inactive to being employed. And there's a couple of trends that came out in all data uh, analysis we did. The first finding is that the biggest jump in mental health is between not working at all, zero hours, to working up to eight hours a week. That's the steepest increase. We also can see some increases further down, but they're not statistically significant, uh, mostly because there's not a large enough number of people in that group. Uh, you can see these lines um, uh, for men, which is uninterrupted line, and for women, but the trends are very similar. So the most significant difference in mental health levels is between people, people not having a job and moving into paid work. That's when mental health increases significantly. Once somebody is in a job, it doesn't matter anymore how many hours they work, their mental health does not change significantly anymore. Despite there is some upwards trend, when we analyze the difference between these data points, they are not statistically significant. This is up to 48 hours a week. We did not analyze beyond 48 hours a week because there's a large body of well-established literature that shows that, except for some particular groups like um, highly paid man with uh, very young children and single woman with no children in, in highly paid jobs for most of people working over 48 hours a week is bad for their mental health. So, uh, so this pattern repeated for all mental health and well-being measures that we uh, uh, looked at in, in general. This few tiny exceptions but the general pattern is what matters is getting a job and once you're in job it does not change your mental health so two findings the minimum dose of work is one day a week only i'm very happy i would take that and there is no optimum dose of work for some once somebody is in a job the next question was what matters more, uh, more is it um, quantity or quality job? We use your per working condition survey for that. A uh, large sample of people working in 35 countries. We replicated the same findings that once you're in job, your mental health significantly it doesn't change depending on number of hours. But we also found that job quality is more important than hours of work especially for such job quality indicators of meaningfulness, feeling doing useful job, intensity, for example, working to tight deadlines, and social environment being supported by colleagues and, and it. job quality matters more than uh, working, uh, working hours. And uh, it affects people independently on how many hours they work. So the third, uh, third study we did is we looked how work, reduced working hours and for law affected people during uh, recent uh, COVID pandemic. And again, we, we are so thankful to understanding societies that they collected data in April. And they were high quality, uh, quite, quite high quality uh, data. And we looked on uh, people's changes in working hours and their mental health. 
Uh, and here you can see a, you can see a graph. Uh, here, a bit confusingly, mental health is higher number is worse mental health, uh, a lower number is better mental health. And then there is a different um, groups of people who had different movements in and out of a different working hours. And you can see on the left hand side, left paid work, that's men and women who left paid work uh, between February 2020 and April 2020. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we compare them to, for example, for Lord people, and we for, uh, compare them to those who remained in full-time employment. And we can see that the worst mental health was for those who left paid work, became unemployed or economically inactive. And the rest of uh, groups, for example, for Lord and those who moved from full-time to part-time employment and those who remained in part-time employment, say mental health was not statistically significantly different from those who remained in full-time job. This was cross-sectional comparison. We just got data this morning from longitudinal data that are more robust. And the, the conclusions remain for low and uh, reduced working hours was good for mental health during um, during uh, COVID pandemic. What are policy implications of these findings? First, from mental health perspective, the working week could safely be radically reduced, even to one hour, uh, one hour a week. From economic perspective, it should be done in mass, which means everybody is having shorter standard working week, not to create. Uh, groups in unemployment uh, that are disadvantaged because they're working considerably less than others. Then job quality matters more than quantity, which means that when we are uh, talking about shorter standard working week, we should also talk about uh, retaining and improving quality of jobs, uh, not only about number of uh, working hours. If we reduce shorter, uh, shorter, uh, if we make a working week shorter, but a job quality reduces, then the mental health effects that might be gained by shorter standard working week might disappear. And reduced working hours and for law might have reduced the extent of mental health crisis, and a shorter standard working week might be a way forward to address the labor market effects of the uh, of the pan uh, pandemic. Um, just a warning, we found somewhere that forecasts not always become true, uh, so there might be no changes that we have predicted, but if they are, it's always wise to be prepared, and our evidence give, uh, gives the tools to, uh, to, uh, to be prepared. And there's a list of our publications related to this topic. Uh, thank you very much for your attention.